Hello, my name is Jeff Bowles and I'm hosting today's webinar. We will give people a chance to get connected and we will start the webinar, webinar promptly at 12 o'clock p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Pigeon Mountain Industries and MRA Mountain Rescue Association Technical Webinar Series. Uh, my name is Jeff Bowles and uh, before we begin I would like to take care of a few housekeeping items. 
<clears throat> so during the webinar, all attendees will be muted for the entire webinar. We will have time at the end of the presentation to answer any questions you may have. For questions related to the presentation topic, you may type in and send questions at any time during the webinar using the questions function on the dashboard. You may use the chat function, which is separate from the questions function, for any other comments you may have. The webinar will last a total of one hour, and we will have about 15 minutes of questions at the end. So please stay with us to the end, uh, especially if you have questions. If you are having trouble with your sound at any time, you may switch from computer to phone or the reverse as needed. Okay, let's get started. Again, my name is Jeff Bowles. I'm the Technical Business Development Manager for Pigeon Mountain Industries and the host of this PMI and Mountain Rescue Association Technical Webinar Series. Uh, today, our topic, our presentation topic is titled Paradise Butte County Fire Search and Rescue Mutual Aid Response for November of 2018. Our presenter today is Rick Kovar. Rick Kovar has been involved with the Contra Costa Sheriff's Search and Rescue Team for over 25 years. He began as a volunteer and has been working full-time with the Sheriff's Office since 2006. Contra Costa's Search and Rescue Team is comprised of 200 volunteers and is an MRA certified team and deploys all over California. Rick is the County Search and Rescue Coordinator for that program and is the County Emergency Services Manager. He participates on the local Type 3 Incident Management Team and instructs ICS and incident management, incident management courses as part of his duties. Uh, this presentation provides an overview of the massive search and rescue response and delves into the lessons learned that can help prepare for the next disaster. Without further delay, I present to you Rick Kovar. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, Thanks for the opportunity to come out and speak to you on this uh, topic. Uh, just to give you a little background on the presentation, it's a, uh, a sort of a conglomeration of a couple of presentations. One I did to the Barrier um, Search and Rescue Council, which is about 12 barrier teams following the, the fire, plus some local AARs, and then some information that we did at the state level with the state SAR coordinators meeting. So it's more of a presentation of lessons learned um, and partially my experiences throughout that. I deployed up to the fires twice um, for a total of about nine days um, over the course of the, of the 17 days that search and rescue deployed. So uh, with that being said, uh, just want to uh, get started and, and talk about where we, uh, where we went with this. So, there we go. Uh, again, my introduction is pretty straightforward. I've been doing search and rescue for, for many years, and in this particular event, in the, my first deployment up there, uh, my program, the Contra Costa Search and Rescue Team, took over uh, incident management from the law side on like day three or day four of the SAR uh, deployment. And during that time, and I'll talk about it in the presentation, uh, we had two separate base camps going, one for the law coroner's operation and one for the fire response. And then um, the weekend that I that our program was in there, we ended up going into a unified command with fire, which was a very unique um, experience for a lot of us who had, had not been in a law fire unified command before. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the main thing that I want to get out of this today is just sort of sharing what, you know, the California search and rescue community uh, experience and what we learned from it and, you know, where we might go in the future. So that's that's what we're going to talk about today. Just to, to give an overview, uh, I'm sure everyone on the, on the phone has heard about the campfire. Uh, it's, this incident was the largest search and rescue uh, search in California history in both its size and duration. And it was a rare situation where there was true unified command between law, search and rescue, National Guard, and CAL FIRE, as well as uh, we had anthropologists involved to help us do identification on decedents. And so we were all working together to uh, do the, the rescue and recovery of these missing people. A little bit of the timeline, uh, the fire itself uh, started in November 2018. 
the week that that fire happened, uh, we were in what's called a red flag condition. And this, I don't know if this is a national definition, but when we have wind conditions, heat and low humidity, uh, the National Weather Service can call for red flag conditions. And so we knew the week of this fire that we were in a very critical stage where, you know, a small fire can jump off and become very large. Um, so uh, we were in a very, um, very dry point at that time in November. The way it rains in California, uh, the rains usually start in November and then go till about March. And in this situation, um, we've been coming out of a drought uh, for the last couple of years. We had rain, um, big rains in 2017, and then the rains for 2018 hadn't started yet. So we had, you know, full six to nine months of dry weather that dried everything out. A fire started on November 8th at 6.33 a.m. in a community called Polga, which is due east of Chico, California. Um, and so between Chico and Polga is the town of Paradise. So the fire kicked off at 6.30. Uh, they started, Butte County started large scale evacuations by the morning of the 9th. And the fire had already burned 20,000 acres. And that day, November 9th, uh, the news reports were coming out that Paradise was destroyed. And I'm about 150 miles away, and we start hearing these reports of paradise destroyed. You sort of sit back and go, okay, um, that seems a little, little over the top, but we'll get more information and see what's, what's happening. Um, CAL FIRE set up its base camp in Chico, and the Butte Sheriff's Office set up their law enforcement incident command post a little closer to the fire at Butte College, which is about 10 to 15 minutes away from paradise. And so there were two separate uh, base camps going, but they also had two separate roles. At this time, Fire was strictly in the um, uh, firefighting mode and Butte SO was really still in the evacuation mode and not the recovery mode. So they had distinct um, things that they were doing separately. So that's why you see two separate base camps. <clears throat> Within two days, the fire had grown to 100,000 acres. And at this time, it was already being reported as the most destructive Cal fire in California history. Um, they had an estimate of 6,700 structures destroyed. And mind you, a year before in October, we had the North Bay wildfires in Sonoma, Napa, and Solano County. And at that time, that was our largest uh, fire disaster in California history. And we did have a large search and rescue response going up to that. And after that event, we we're like, okay, we'll never see that again. And just a short year later, uh, they basically tripled the size of the destruction with this fire. By November, November 12th, uh, Search and rescue teams, volunteer SAR teams had been requested through mutual aid and began deploying uh, to, the, to Paradise and to Butte County to begin the, the uh, uh, task of looking for and recovering decedents um, in the fire zone. <clears throat> November 16th, uh, which was a, we were well within, well deep into the search and rescue and recovery operations. The missing persons cases jumped from 200 to a little over a thousand. I'll talk a little bit about why that happened and how it how it changed back down to a smaller number in a, later in the presentation. And then 17 late, days later, at, we uh, suspended mutual aid search and rescue operations on November 29th. So we had a 17 straight days of, of full activation and, and searching for missing people. In the end, uh, it was a total of 153,000 acres burned, 14,000 residences were, were destroyed, and never before had we seen that many uh, personal homes burned out. Um, and the death toll ended up being, uh, give or take, 85 is the, is the final number that we're looking at that were killed by this fire. So just to give you a little context where it is in California. So Paradise in Butte County uh, is about 171 miles northeast of San Francisco. LA is about 470 miles south of here. The Oregon border is about 230 miles north. So it's in uh, north, little northeast in California in the foothills of the Sierras. Um, so a lot of hilly country and a lot of uh, pine and grassland um, in the areas that burned. Again, a little bit more context, oops, sorry. Here's the map uh, overlaid into the Bay Area where I come from. If this fire was here, this is this is the size that it would have burned out locally. I mean, again, statistically, it's not going to burn this these areas. I just wanted to show you on a map how big 153,000 acres actually is. <clears throat> uh, when we landed, uh, and I'll talk about the first landing, this is what we, we came across. So search and rescue was deployed 
into paradise to begin um, uh, organized search and recovery operations. The air was still um, that picture in the top right corner, that air is about what we were breathing for the first week. It was still very smoky. We weren't at risk for being near the fire itself or being at risk of, of getting caught in a firestorm. Uh, but the the grounds were were dusty, dirty, smoky, ashy, and the air was just brutal to be to be breathing um, in that time. Uh, we talk about it being the largest search and rescue deployment in California history. Over the course of those two and a half weeks, we had 54 of 58 counties, um, uh, California counties, deploy search and rescue teams. Uh, never before had we done that big of a deployment. Uh, and a lot of it was lessons learned from the previous fire in 2017 on, on how and when. Um, we had such a large area that it became readily apparent that we needed these resources. Uh, Cal OES was managing all of the mutual aid requests. And so uh, it was a full-time job for their law coordinator up there to just be uh, coordinating and contacting these agencies to bring in resources daily. And again, over 17 days, we were, we were running 400 plus SAR volunteers at this event. We pulled SAR teams down from Oregon. You, know, you see in the bottom right there, we had about six counties from Oregon, a uh, county from Nevada that we work closely with because they're right up, up in Tahoe, right on the California border. Um, and then uh, some uh, state search and rescue canine uh, programs that brought in dogs. And again, we had a lot of other resources. I'm not gonna get too deep into that, but National Guard became a big player and I'll talk about them. We had forensic anthropology teams that came in and um, coincidentally at Chico State, which is in Butte County, has a very large anthropology program and they provide a lot of resources for us to be able to identify bones when they were found. <clears throat> and then one of the more unique things that we experienced was uh, co-locating and working with FEMA USAR task force and state regional uh, USAR task forces that came in and worked side by side with the, with the search and rescue teams. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go go through this. Um, on average, we had between four and 600 search and rescue personnel um, on the peak on the weekend of the 17th and 18th. The search numbers that we were managing was around 1200, but that wasn't just search and rescue. That was the law enforcement coroners and the USAR task forces but in, a, in, the, in the unified command. That's what we were uh, working with as far as resources to do the search and, and recovery operations. Uh, one of the unique things that we we did uh, um, during the course of this event is in California, there's only a few teams that really have the depth to take on an incident management team role. And so Marin County was the first team to go in there. They're, they're an MRA team and they sort of set up operations in conjunction with Butte County themselves. Uh, Butte County was always the incident commander throughout this. Uh, but they relied on some of the other search and rescue teams uh, in California to come in and help manage this large uh, mutual aid response. So Marin County came in and started the ball running uh, with it, getting the CP set up. And then our program, Contra Costa, came in on the fourth day. And then the unique thing that we we got to experience was in the, in the time frame from November 15th to 18th was when we went into the unified command with fire. And so I'll talk a little bit about the challenges of, of putting a law enforcement organization into a fire organization and seeing how well they, they work together. <clears throat> Nevada County, which was another MRA team, came in and took over for our program. So we were averaging about four day um, management uh, overall. So when I say, you know, Contra Costa came in there, what we did is we provided a a framework and then we had other county teams that came in and also augmented you know operations planning in the logistics section so we were just sort of the the skeleton that, and then brought in resources from all over uh, to help within the uh, command post monterey county a big shout out to to them uh joe moses who's uh, a commander with monterey county was pretty much the search manager for the whole operation uh, which was great to have. He's a commander and having his his decision making authority to work with fire was was great to have. Um, so they were there, even though it says 1123, he was there from uh, the majority of the time out there in, Mar uh, in Monterey uh, and their deputies were there for a long period of time. So I don't I don't want to take credit where those guys were there for the for the majority of the time. <clears throat> This is just an example of what we experienced. So this was Sunday the 18th, um, and just for, for time purposes, I don't wanna go through each day's uh, operation, but this one just gives 
an idea of the complexity. Uh, we had over 400 search and rescue volunteers in this um, incident command. We had 40 county teams on scene that day, and then 500 uh, fire and USAR task force members, as well as coroner's investigators. So we were close to 1,200 on, on the 18th um, within Unified Command, which I've, I've been on a lot of incidences, but nothing close to the size of this, this organization. <clears throat> so it was definitely a great lessons learned. Uh, we had a, uh, a, we went into Unified Command again on the Friday, the, the 16th into the 17th, um, where it was, it was actually a, a concerted effort to, to squish all of these different um, resources and jurisdictions under one uh, command structure. One of the things that we were we struggled with in that first week was trying to manage all of the search and rescue teams. And in, in typical search searches, when we're looking for a missing person, we write a plan for a individual team of you know four to six search and rescue team members and give them the parameters of what they're going to do and um, and where they're going to do it and how they're going to do it and how they're going to report it back. And so we were spending a lot of time when you think about you know six to eight hundred individuals that are divided into different different response teams writing individual plans and it really slowed the process down and um, it took us a, a, a little bit of time and then we we transferred over to uh, planning for groups and branches and so from the from the incident command perspective in the plan section we started writing general plans for okay the branch coordinator is going to be responsible for eight strike teams um, and we just wrote the general orders for that branch director and then left them up to their own devices in the field, basically a field incident command post to then within a geographic area, use their resources and tell them where to go and how to go. And what this did is it really streamlined our planning process. Um, and it was just something because we hadn't worked something this large, it, we had to evolve um, as we were um, doing this exercise. <clears throat> There were few specific missing person searches to work on. Um, during this, we had a separate coroner's investigation operation. And so a missing persons report would come in. They would um, enter it into their system. They'd work on it and they'd come up with a location that this person was last seen. And then they would, at some point, the investigators would then pass that information on to our plan section to write a specific plan to go search that area. And so we called that targeted searching and we try to do our best to do targeted searching you know using resources effectively go to this trailer and look to see if you can find mrs smith who's been reported missing this backed up a little bit uh because there were so many missing person reports that came in uh, they started bringing in mutual aid detectives to help that operation to, to um, carry out these uh, uh missing person reports and just to give you some anecdotal on that so we had we started out the week with about 200 missing persons and then friday the 16th after a press conference the number jumped from a couple hundred to over a thousand and it got back to us in the command post like whoa where did that come from and so what was happening was people were just calling in and saying hey they hadn't seen this person or that person and they live in this at, at this location and so every one of those reports then became a missing person and so then they had the investigators had to deconflict that because if if um, it was Thomas Smith or Tom Smith or T Smith, a lot of times that came into three separate missing people, and so that's why the numbers jumped. Is they just got really good at, at documenting all of these missing people. The problem was is then they'd have to go in and investigate and find out if that's the same person or that's a different person. And there was one that I I, I still remember where someone called in and said, hey, we hadn't seen Uncle Joe um, and he lives up in paradise and we haven't heard from him. So they go and they, they do their investigation, they run him out, they look, look for any information, they find out he died four years ago. That was still a missing person until they could report and investigate it. So that's, we were dealing with a lot of that as well. So that's why you saw these numbers that were so high and then it just took, you know, good old fashioned gumshoe work to, to bring those numbers down to a, a little more manageable level. Um, we did, uh, we had targeted searching where we were sending teams to specific locations, but the majority of the searching were just basically map coordinates where we took pre-designated evacuation zones that Butte County had already designed and created strike teams and search teams to go and work that zone during their, their course of 
um, of their uh, deployment that day. <clears throat> so the sheriff wanted to, to ensure that we left no stone unturned. And so we, we turned to house to house searching. So within that evacuation zone, every residence had to have a level of searching so that um, before we were able to open the burned out area to the community, um, the, you know, Butte County was comfortable that we weren't going to have people um, go back to their burned out house and find someone's uh, remains in there that, uh, that we might have missed. So there was a concerted effort to do a very thorough searching. We had to, um, when a lot of these uh, structures, we, there were a lot of mobile homes there. When they burn, they basically burn out and the roof falls on top of it and the roof's somewhat intact. So every one of these residences, we had to go in and tear the roof off to get in to, to look for these decedents. Um, so it was uh, pretty tedious and time consuming. So we estimated by, by looking at what our searchers were doing, we estimated that it would take um, to do a very thorough search on each house, about one house a day per search team um, with a very thorough search approach. And so with 14,000 houses, uh, we did some really rough math and don't, don't quote me on the math on this, but we determined that we would need 600 searchers a day for up to 18 straight days to, to clear this location. So we knew fairly early, early on, this was going to be a monumental search task. Um, we learned pretty quickly in our unified command that law enforcement and fire have somewhat different priorities and in, in how the, they run an operation. So when I talk about the law enforcement fire unified command, we went into unified command with fire once active firefighting was over and it became a much larger uh, recovery operation. Fire does incident command system very well. Law does it very well, but we sometimes speak different languages. Um, their priority, fire's prioritization was repopulation and the whole planning process around each day's activities. Whereas law, we wanted to prioritize finding missing per persons um, and make sure that the area was safe for the public to go back into. Going back to the IEP planning process, this became a very large uh, challenge for us. That first Friday um, when we started to go into the Unified Command, uh, we were working in our command post up in Paradise and we knew we were moving into a, a base camp. Fire called up and said, okay, we've got the IAP done for tomorrow, the Incident Action Plan, which is the basis for, for the operation. But, our planning section hadn't talked to anyone and hadn't talked to anyone about resources. And um, we, in search and rescue, our IAPs tend to be driven the night before the next operation, whereas fire has the ability to, to fill out a full incident action plan 24 hours in advance. When we're trying to seek out volunteer uh, search and rescue members, it takes time for the local agency to, to coordinate those resources and get that information back up. So it's really hard for us to have a 24 hour planning cycle. So we struggled with that. So FIRE just published a large incident action plan, basically ignoring all the law side of it because we couldn't get that information in there. And we sort of had to agree to disagree that that's what we were going to do. It got better once we were all co-located, um, but it was a struggle throughout the, the, um, the, the week and a half that we were in that unified command um, on prioritization and whose priorities took precedent. When we did the math and, and determined that the search searcher days and the searcher numbers were going to be huge. Fire did a great job and they they really ramped up the resource request and they put it they brought in um, federal a couple of federal uh, USAR task forces and the, some of the state uh, USAR task forces which really increased our numbers and that was great for a couple of reasons. One it gave us more bodies to 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 dig through the rubble but they also brought the tools and the expertise on how to pull those roofs off safely they were also able to provide safety in case there were hot spots that um, our searchers were going into and so we ended up dividing our uh, search teams into a combination of search and rescue and either use our task force or fire task forces um, so that that worked in the on the field level on the on the, the boots on the ground side the unified command uh, worked out really well um, GIS mapping took the lead, especially with the Unified Command. What we needed to do was map every one of those 14,000 residences and on that map show the level of searching that had happened. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about mapping in a second because uh, that became a little bit of a challenge and something that we'll need to work on in the future. Uh, National Guard was here in force on this event. Uh, we've worked with them in search and rescue where they come out to a lot of our wilderness searches and bring their GPS nano tracking devices and deploy those with our teams. 
this was one of the first events um, that I worked with them where they brought in, you know, on average 100 to 300 people a day to help with ground searching. They took over all decontamination of searchers, and I'll talk about that. Uh, they brought in heavy equipment that they could tear buildings apart that were um, uh, that were basically rubble, but we needed to get in there to look for decedents. <clears throat> and they took over the logistics support of issuing out equipment uh, during the event as well. So it was a that was a really great relationship. They were value added. They were um, their commanders were there and just were all every day. Hey, what could we do to help? Um, and they were able to. One of the big things that was very helpful was in the middle of this response, uh, we came up on Thanksgiving and they uh, volunteered to continue full active searching on um, Thanksgiving so the, the search and rescue member volunteers and the law people could go to their back to their families and celebrate Thanksgiving and they stayed on on task and continued to work that day. So we were continuously doing search operations even through the holiday. <clears throat> So with that being said, I just want to jump into some of the lessons learned that we came across and what we're going to be working on, not only locally, but at the state level as a um, uh, just a response to how things went. Our AAR process, I look at it as kind of three pronged here in California. Each of the local teams that responded um, should, I can speak for ours, um, we did a pretty high level set of after action reviews. We put together an online survey that every team member that responded could fill out a whole all different categories of you know what how was the response how was the care and feeding what was the post response um, areas that you'd like to look at and then we had a, a sit down uh, after action review meeting and development improvement plans locally and then we we have a, a program here in the bay area uh, the bay area search and rescue council and we met with those 12 counties and worked on uh, the response and some of the lessons learned at that level. And then in, in California, the state uh, search and rescue coordinators meet quarterly, um, which is sponsored by the California Office of Emergency Services. And so they had an online survey that uh, was developed by Marin County that all the counties could, could fill out. And then we sat down at a quarterly meeting and talked about uh, lessons learned and strategies going forward. So a lot of, a lot of work's being done. A lot of work still needs to be done to uh, to work on some of these improvement plans. I'm just going to walk through some of the things that we uh, we learned. So from the, the state Cal OES after action notes. So this is what was discussed at the state SAR coordinators meeting with the with the county coordinators. Uh, some big picture theme areas. Unified command. We all agreed was a struggle. And uh, this isn't a, a knock on fire, but fire does incident command very well they they do these big large fire operations very well and they will not change any of their strategies or any of their their the way they do unified command and so when we as search and rescue and law enforcement came into that base camp the expectation was we were going to change everything we do to meet their standard uh, and so that caused a little bit of friction uh, and it basically what it, what it comes down to is really understanding both sides and how they work in these large operations to minimize any of that friction. And so we're working on um, developing some, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, incident management team uh, uh, guidelines for search and rescue here in, in California. We, uh, we got a lot of feedback. Uh, we would do these large operations briefings in the morning with you know between 400 and 1200 people. And we would give direction, here's how we want you to search each residence with an idea that that was pretty clear. But different teams have different training standards and different cultures. And so you could tell a, a team, hey, we want you to search uh, all the high probability areas of this residence and um, to a, you know, a 70 or a 50 to 75 percent probability detection in that uh, that home team, wherever they came from, may have a different perspective. And so we were finding that there were teams that when we, one team would search a residence and take 40 minutes and the same residence by another team would take two hours. And it's not a, not a knock on either of those teams on how well or how um, inefficient they were. Uh, part of it came down to really being clear with, with our leaders intent on what our expectation that assignment could be, and we we needed we needed to get better at that in those briefings and in the paperwork to say here's how to do this. Um, and I think we'll have that problem again if we if we go through this event. It's just but from a from a 
incident command perspective, we just need to be cognizant that that leader's intent is very clear across the board. Uh, GIS mapping and documentation was was good um, by search and rescue standards, and it was good by fire standards. But we use a program called SAR Topo here in California, which is a, a kind of proprietary, but I'm pretty sure it's it's elsewhere in not just in California. That is really great. Um, mapping software for day-to-day -day search and rescue operations is really good at, at documenting areas coverage. But the problem was, is when we went into Unified Command and Fire was running their base camp, they have a whole GIS um, section that comes in and they, they produce these huge coverage maps that show really good descriptive analysis of each residence that's covered. And our problem was, is we come back with these SAR Topo program that wouldn't feed into GIS. And so um, over the course of the first few days, what was happening was we bring these, our, our maps and the fire would work all night with a hard copy of our SAR Topo maps and hand right in to their program where the searching happened as opposed to being able to download and, and feed that directly. I know we're working on that ability, but it, one of the things that we also need to think about from the California SAR community perspective is if we do any more of these large disaster operations, we need to be a little bit more dynamic on the fire GIS side um, or make you know SAR Topo, and I, I don't want to speak for programming, have SAR Topo be able to be automatically read into the fire GIS mapping. During those briefings that I was talking about, those operational briefings, we were trying to get a lot of information across in a short amount of time to get these teams out in the field. And when you're dealing with 400 to 1200 people, there's a lot of minutia in the briefings. We did a lot of uh, conversation, what we call just in time training where the um, uh, archeologists would come in and, and talk. They had pictures, uh, sign boards with pictures of what bones look like after a fire. Um, but it turns out again, uh, what command thought was the points that were getting across weren't quite as clear to the operators in the field. And so um, what we need to do next time or to be better at is making sure what our briefings and our just-in-time training really are as specific and in-depth um, as possible. And we need to come up with creative ways to make that. So this operations briefing is not two and a half hours long, but we still need to get that information out. So there's more to come on that, uh, but the just-in-time training is absolutely valuable if you're deploying search and rescue teams into environments that they don't always work and the majority of our teams don't do this type of large-scale body recovery um, and just keep in mind when I talk about these bones when these fires would happen what we were finding were parts and pieces of, of bodies not not intact skeletons you know so a femur bone which you know is a pretty large bone what we would find is like a three inch long um, what was left of three inches of that bone and, and trying to identify that as bone and not melted down insulation was pretty tricky. So the just-in-time training was trying tried to show pictures and, and, and also show uh, what these bones might look like along with the archaeologists talking about it. Um, so that was, uh, <clears throat> that was a struggle. Personal protection equipment, this was a hundred times better than it was for our mass deployment into Sonoma. I give credit to Mike St. John in Marin County, who was um, the ops lead on that first day of search operations. And he he did a good job of pushing the local authority of Butte County to, to get really good personal protection equipment. And so the Butte County went out and probably raided every um, Lowe's and Home Depot in Northern California in that first two days to buy P100 masks and Tyvek suits and gloves and booties and, and all this stuff. And so they, they were able to, our, um, PPE for this one was way better. Last year in Sonoma, you know, we'd have an N95 mask and search through the rubble, come back, and a deputy with a leaf blower would blow the dust off you, and that was PPE. This time around, we had full uh, Tyvek suits. We had the uh, really good particulate respirator mask with, with filters, uh, gloves, and goggles, and so that was that was a big step up. Uh, but it, what we're talking about locally is creating caches locally. So, you know, if we are deploying to a county um, for a disaster that's not our own, we'll have at least a day, if not a couple of days, of supply of PPE before the system can, can build that um, product up. Decontamination, again, as part of the PPE was huge. As I mentioned before, you know, in Sonoma, we had a leaf blower blowing the, the particles off of us. This year, this time around up in Butte, National Guard brought their full decon stations. And so we had 
tents and and um, and washing stations. And every t every team that would go out for the day, they'd go and do their business. They'd come back, and before they do anything, they'd go through a, a decon station and get cleaned off. And as well as the canines that were up there, they got cleaned as well. Logistics, I thought, was very well done considering the size of this. You know, the first few days it was a little tricky, but you know, when you bring in a couple hundred people into a disaster zone, it is going to be tricky. But um, Butte County did an awesome job. I would hate to see what their credit card bills were for that first week because they were just going out and, and any request that was made, they'd go out and try and fill it before we moved into this unified command where a, a fire base camp took over. Um, there was a lot of lot of uh, um, scrambling around, but it, again, it was it was a great job. Just for future reference, you know, I what we talk about locally in our county is if we were to to host this type of event where we were bringing in this many teams, how would we do this at that scale, and what would we do? And so we're coming up with some pre-plan uh, thoughts on how to do that. So it's not trying to reinvent the wheel if we experience this. <clears throat> uh, the, I mentioned a little bit before that we had sort of pre-identified a couple of programs here in California that were um, sort of taking the lead as far as the SAR management teams were concerned. And so a lot of our discussion at the state level is coming up with, uh, we're updating guidelines for creating um, both in-house for each of, the, each of the county programs to create an incident management team locally. But at some point we're going to be creating these regional incident management teams in California, so it you know next time we got to push the button. Instead of calling up an individual county, we'll, we'll deploy a state search and rescue incident management team. A lot of work to be done on that, but that's really the evolution. That's where we're going here in the next year or two. Um, the coroner's missing person investigation uh, was going. It was really good. I mean, there was a lot of resources uh, put into this from a lot of uh, agencies throughout Northern California. Um, where there was a little bit of a disconnect that we constantly had to struggle with was getting the coroner's investigation information over to the uh, planning section to be able to execute and develop plans for, for future search operations. And it's tricky um, because it is a coroner slash missing person law enforcement investigation. So we have to be um, cognizant of the, of the, um, uh, the sensitivity to that type of investigation, but also work on making sure that there's a collaboration so we are keeping a good assignment flow going for, for investigations that are, are dealt out. And one of the things I did when I was in there is I, I took a one of our people and I just made them the coroner's missing person liaison and I just had her every half hour go over to that section and get as much information as she could to bring over to back to plans to, to be able to execute things and that worked out and so uh, one of the things we'll do next time is make that a, a structured position uh, that liaison person to be able to keep that information flow going. Just to sort of give you an idea of resource management, uh, we still do everything very much by paper at this size level of event. Um, and so sign in is all paper driven and, and tracking T cards is paper driven when we're dealing with 400, 600 people. So um, this is a very fancy filing system you see on the right. It's, it's a uh, line paper that we just track each of those, um, our counties and what they were bringing on this particular day. We were getting this information, basically the, the law duty officer who was doing the the mutual aid coordination would write this down and then we would have to take this information and put it into our planning process to create the, the plans uh, for each of the operational periods. So it's a lot of, lot of different counties. One of the things that is a, a huge benefit in, in California, and I'm, again, I can't speak for the rest of this country, is we have a set of standardized guidelines for training for search and rescue. So when these teams show up, we know that there's at least a basic level, not, you know, there's 20 teams in California that are MRA certified. Uh, and so uh, a lot of other teams don't have, have that, um, you know, basically patch on their sleeve where we can go, okay, we know that they've trained to a certain level, but we know that all of these teams have a rudimentary basic um, level of training. So we are able to put them in with, with, um, the knowledge that they're going to be able to effectively uh, do the task that we're requesting of them, and that, so that's a that's a huge thing in California to be able to know that when we call for mutual aid, we're getting um, the right resources. And it's a typing system. We basically have three types 
typing um, structures, type three, type two, and type one. And each one of those has a definition of training. Type one is basically a, a wilderness search and rescue member that you know can meet an MRA standard. Uh, and the type three, uh, at least in my county, is about 50 hours of urban suburban search and rescue training. Um, and so in this environment, from the Contra Costa perspective, we did not send any of our type three certified members, um, only our type two and type one team members deployed uh, up there. And that was mainly from our perspective of, of knowledge, training, and, and skills and abilities. We knew that the type ones and twos could manage you know, multiple day deployments up into this environment. And so it's different from team to team, but those typings, if, if, you know, if a county in Southern California says, yeah, we're type two trained, we know um, what they can do. Or if they're type one trained, we know that, that they have a little higher capability. And so we're able to um, define that when we're creating our plans for the next day. <clears throat> I, I talked a little bit about missing persons investigation. It was a, it was a very large event. You know, when you talk about a thousand people that are missing, um, and then the numbers of uh, decedents that were being recovered, um, certainly over the course of the days, wasn't going to come close to a thousand because um, 85 sounds like a lot of, of, of decedents. But at first, when you when you're talking about a thousand missing people, you mentally prepare for the, for a lot more than that. Um, Butte County was incredible. Again, when you look at the level of destruction, and just to to, to anecdotally talk a little bit about that. Um, Butte County Sheriff's Office is not a large sheriff's office. Uh, Butte County is a little bit more rural, remote county. 25% um, of their deputies lost their homes in this event, yet they were there every day staffing in from the missing person investigation side. Whenever a, a search team found what they thought was a body, they would be called in and then Butte County um, took it upon themselves. They wanted to investigate and do the recovery with their personnel. So they were able to do that. And it was, you know, I think from a from a mental perspective, that's that's what they wanted to do. And it was great. They wanted to take care of their own people. Um, my hat's off to them to be able to, to respond and manage a disaster this large and keep showing up each day. Uh, one of the really good resources we had was uh, this, these anthropologists that came in from all over the place. And they were able, uh, we, for a while there, we were deploying them with each team to go out. So with, if there was a pile of rubble slash possible bones, um, they were able to quickly identify whether or not that was human or animal or, or not even human, um, biological. And that was extremely important to speed up the, the, re the recovery process. Later in the in the coming days, what we did is we we set separated them out, and then we had them deploy when there were when a team made a, a potential find, they would call in an for anthropologist. It just became a better resource use than having them deployed out to areas that we weren't finding anything. Uh, but they were huge in in helping us identify uh, what what was out there. Um, Workflow and information sharing I talked about, it, we need to be better at sharing that investigation and missing person leads with this, the search uh, management team so they can develop planning for the next day. And then lastly on that, what we did specifically is we created what we call the alpha group. And this was a specific group of, of um, law, search and rescue, and USAR fire team members and anthropologists that were just waiting in the wings for if there was what we call a targeted search, where a report came back with a, call it a hot clue that there, there is a residence at this location. And so we had them um, basically deploying all over the burn area uh, separately, but in conjunction with our, our regular search teams that were geographically just clearing large areas, the alpha group would go in and, and hit specific areas. And that worked out really well to, to quickly um, try and close uh, these missing person leads that we were getting in. Um, so this was all going on again through the, through, through the same command post. Uh, talking about bones, these are just some pictures of different types of things that were found. So the left picture is is a burned out mobile home, and in the black area there is is what's left of a a person. Um, and it's hard from if you look from far away, it doesn't look like anything. 
top right corner is a, I think that's an artificial hip that was recovered. That was all that was found. But we were able to, uh, we learned this at the Sonoma fires, we were able to identify people because there's individual serial numbers on these replacement parts that tie you directly to that missing person. So we found a few of those. And then the bottom right is not only human bone, but also some uh, uh, other things that we were finding, which a lot of insulation, when it melts, it melts into these white hard substances that look like bones. Um, so occasionally there were intact um, bodies, but the majority uh, of what was being um, searched for and recovered were parts. And so that's why the anthropologist became very important for teams. There were a lot of possible hits. Uh, we had a report last month from the anthropologists and they would get, um, they would, I think it was less than 50% of their, their deployments to areas that were people where teams thought they found a person that they turned out to actually be a, a, a human body and it, but it took their expertise to figure that out. So that was a really um, important thing that they were pulled in early into the search operations to have them there. I talked about mapping. This is a picture of the uh, GIS mapping where they, each of the fire uh, teams would go out and they would have a Venza on their phones or their, their GPSs, and they would drop a pin at every location and they were able to quickly upload that into the GIS system. And then the, the SAR Topo had their own separate mapping system. And as I mentioned, we would have to manually uh, clear those over. So when that became really apparent that we were working under the fire auspices in their GIS, we started deploying a fire, basically a fire engine with, with, a, with a fire, uh, team on that fire engine with each search team. So the search team would go and they'd clear the building and then the fire guys either would help, but they would um, embedded with that search and rescue team would drop the pin. And so we stopped having to use um, the manual SAR topo transfer and we just went to their system. Um, Avenza was one of the <coughs> software and then they have an, another system called Iron Sights, uh, which is a little bit older, but Avenza is sort of the future for this type of operation if we're working in in mutual aid to be able to have that Avenza app uploaded into the fire GIS system. It ended up being very, these maps became very um, good for briefing materials to show the chain of command. Here's our coverage, here's what we found, here's, here's what we cleared this area. We're happy that um, we've searched this to a level that we think we found everything that was obvious. Um, the sheriff was very good at communicating to the public that while we're doing this level of searching and, and clearing of these properties, we know there's going to be um, bodies that are going to be found after the fact. It's just it's just part of this. But what his his goal was that we did the best we could to clear these areas before he let the residents back into their and sift through their uh, damaged structures. And the mapping was a great way to show that we we felt we had good coverage of each of these geographic locations. <clears throat> so it's absolutely vital. So we've got a lot of work to do um, on on that if we if we continue down these disaster responses. These are some pictures of the decon operations. So as I mentioned, the National Guard uh, brought in their their decon stations, and teams would line up at the end of their shift and go in and clear clean themselves off and then head on either get will they go into debriefing and then they go into rehab after that so this work these these were open and, and ready to go uh, all day long and all night while we had searchers out in the field uh, one of the lessons learned on decon is um you know we'd send teams out in their vehicles and they'd search all day they they'd climb in the cars and you know they'd take their tyvek suits off most likely and climb in their cars and go to the next site we were doing a really good job of cleaning individuals off, but then they'd get back in the in their patrol vehicles, which were not decon very well. So at least my team, and I can't speak for other teams, is we're we're now deploying with roles at this queen where we'll cover the seats during the operation, and so we aren't aren't going to need to uh, disinfect our cars after the fact. But the problem was is they go and get cleaned off here and this, and then they get back in their car, so there's there's potential cross contamination. Um, so we, again, decon was a hundred times better than it was for the for the Sonoma fires, but we also still had things that we needed to learn from. So we're getting better, and and the only thing I can say is each of these events, if we're getting better, that's a good thing, and not you know, going backwards. Uh, I talked about the National Guard, but I just want to put a plug in to their Nano program, and I can't speak for anybody but the California National Guard. Uh, they, California SAR community works with the National Guard a lot on 
searches, especially in remote areas in, our, in the Sierras. And these guys come out and they give us these tracking devices where it gives us real time tracking 24 seven, two way, um, uh, uh, not paging, but a text system where we can actually um, text back and forth information, uh, which is a great, great thing. And back in the command post, we can track individual teams with these things. So again, I can't speak for outside of California, but if you have National Guard programs and you're not sure if they have a nano program, it's, it's something to reach out to your local guard programs and see if they have that. Our National Guard are um, really good at deploying on our part our normal uh, missing person searches. And then for this event, they were great as well. They brought huge caches and we're starting to, to communicate and, and negotiate with them about having these nano devices deployed um, permanently with our individual home team so we can use them. Um, still more work to happen on that and a lot of negotiation with the with the federal DOD uh, people on that. But it's it's the way of the future um, as far as being able to provide large scale uh, GPS tracking and communications with your teams. I'm gonna not show the drone footage, but it, I think you guys will have access to the these slides. Uh, there's a great YouTube video so you can sort of get an, an idea of what the destruction looked like. <clears throat> and then uh, Alameda County, which is the county right south of us, and Contra Costa County have very good drone programs as part of their law enforcement operations. And we deployed along with Alameda up there and our drones mapped all 150,000 acres of the burned area with with 360 degree images, which are really good from a post event recovery, as well as during the event, being able to analyze terrain and look where, where we wanted to put searchers. Uh, so that so drones in, in at least in Northern California are really becoming part of the, the normal deployment package on our disaster responses worked out really well. So those are two links that you can see sort of the work that the drones did. Uh, I talked about the uh, uh, GIS mapping. This this picture shows uh, each each of those dots. Um, the red represents structures fully destroyed, black or partial destroyed, and green are are still intact. And if you look anywhere where there's no color, that's just open wilderness, and then, and there's no residence there. But you can see this is the downtown paradise right in the center of that. Completely, the level of of destruction that this fire created was nothing like I'd seen, you know, going up to Son Sonoma and Napa and Solano fires the year before, it was, you know, 4,000 structures were burned, but it was, you know, hit or miss, there'd be a, you know, a couple of houses and then um, there'd be a, a clear area of houses that didn't burn. Here, it was just like a, a bowling ball went over this whole place and just burned it out. This uh, link can show you <laughs> specifically house by house, the information we were downloading and um, what they're using from the recovery side to show the level of damage. So there's a lot of good technology out there that's tracking um, destruction and, and uh, damage for recovery purposes. I'm gonna show you some pictures just to walk through. When we landed that first week, we were working in a very austere environment. Um, the search and rescue law enforcement command post moved from Butte County up into downtown Paradise, and we were at the lovely Tall Pines bowling alley. There was no power inside the bowling alley initially, and so this is a picture in the command post planning section sort of working through some map uh, briefing problems. Uh, this was uh, operations briefing with, with group leads inside the bowling alley. Um, there, we ended up getting power in there because we brought a generator in and plugged in. Uh, it, in California, uh, they're all bowling alleys are smoke free. I can't speak for the rest of the country, but if you, this picture is not real clear, but you can see there's a haze. We were working in a haze. It was like bowling alleys in the 70s here uh, with the amount of smoke that was just billowing around. Some more pictures in the dark working um, in the plan section early on uh, in that uh, bowling alley, developing plans for the next day. My favorite command post ever, we were in the bar. This is one of my IT guys working at the bar um, and developing mapping for the for our operation. Uh, Jack Storen, he's a sergeant with Butte County. He was the incident commander. He, he's here briefing. Um, this is up at the bowling alley, briefing operations group for one of the days that we were up there. <clears throat> and you can see in the background, that's that level of smoke is what we were working in for the first week. Um, while there was no risk of fire locally, we were still in pea soup levels of smoke. 
uh, bedding down for the night in the bowling alley. Uh, just uh, you can see the smoke in the in the uh, under the uh, 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 light fixture there. <clears throat> Uh, this is the back of Sheriff Honey. He's the Sheriff of Butte County. They're going to be writing books about crisis management and crisis communication starring him. He did an amazing job over the course of these, this event to not only be the face of the event and working with the elected officials and doing the press conferences, uh, but he was so supportive and he would come out daily and talk to the search and rescue volunteers and thank them. And he'd drive up into the, into the search area um, to, again, thank them and show support. Just a, a, an incredible job that, again, for a, for a county that is as small as Butte, they, um, they have a very good response model in, in time of disaster. <clears throat> it's a picture of the National Guard managing just the PPE logistics. So this is a, a building that just has Tyvek suits and P100 masks, and, and this is just one part of the logistics arm of this event, but just to give you an idea of, of the level and numbers of things that were were um, being purchased and acquired to, to be deployed. Again, uh, Butte County managed the, once the, the decedent was found, they managed the, the investigation recovery um, just as far as it's their community, they wanted to take care of their community members. <clears throat> and then we moved to the base camp. So we were in pretty austere conditions up in paradise for that first five or six days. And then we moved down into uh, the unified base camp. And so the Friday night, um, after being there for a couple of days and, and living in filth and smoke, uh, first thing I get down to the base camp and they provided us dinner. Um, they, the care and feeding inside these Cal Fire base camps are amazing. Um, they really take care of their first responders. But they also bring a huge logistics arm that just makes uh, having a, to work and respond to these conditions um, amazing. So that trailer right there is just a photocopier and laminating trailer. So we would be able to give them maps or pictures and say, hey, laminate this. And five minutes later, they'd bring it out. The table in front is our sign-in table for, for search and rescue resources. And you can see it's divided up um, in by letter of the county. So, you know, your county starts with M through R. Here's the line you stand in. Because again, when you're dealing with 40 plus counties, the morning sign-in becomes really crazy. <clears throat> Uh, we were living out of tents now that had light heating as well at the um, at these base camps. So it was a lot different than sleeping in your bag. Either in a, I was in our ops trailer. Some people were in the in the bowling alley. Um, so this it just became a little bit more comfortable uh, living conditions. The feeding area was huge. Um, they were able to feed you know 500 to 1,000 people at any given time. Um, the salad bar at the feeding area. Again, um, most searches were on it. I usually have a credit card that I can buy pizzas um, for you know, on normal day-to-day -day searches. We were um, sending our, the food bill for this base camp ended up being about eight to $10,000 a day just for food for the search and rescue slash law enforcement responders. So it, was a, it ended up being a pretty expensive day-to-day -day, um, operation. Talk about logistics at the base camp each day. At the end of the day, we could drop our soiled, stinky clothing off at the laundromat and pick it up the next morning for the next day's operations. Uh, so again, they did a really good job of care and feeding over the course of the event. Another sleeping area. <clears throat> um, one of the things I talk about from the incident management team perspective, the number of meetings and stakeholder briefings that we end up having to go to as a section chief. Uh, my day as a as plans. Um, guy was basically I had to have a staff under me doing all the, the heavy lifting and I was just going to, this is just from basically 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. Um, every hour basically on the hour we were having meetings with different groups and this we don't see this in day-to-day -day search operations but when you get into a large-scale response this is what we get. Um, this was a briefing that I did the Sunday morning to with 1200 people so just to give you scale the size of this brief these briefings were crazy. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. These are just more pictures, um, team specific ARs. From my perspective, we're going to do a much better job. I was deploying between 40 and 50 of our team members up to this event daily. And even though there was a good, strong command post, I just wanted what we're going to do next time is have someone in charge of just managing our own internal resources and liaisoning with the command post. Because uh, I couldn't ask the command post, hey, where's this team specifically? And so I want to have someone assigned to that going forward if we're going into disaster zones. Um, 
we're going to be much better at PPE safety. Um, like I said, our, we're going to have our own cash in-house of PPE. So when we deploy, we know from day one, hour one, <coughs> I can keep our people as safe as possible. I'm going to try and fly through this because I know we're getting near the end of the time limit. Um, the decon and debriefing was important. So making sure that your team members understood what they needed to do and how they needed to do decon and not necessarily leave it to each person to figure out. But we would brief the team each day. Here's what you're going to do at the end of the day to clean yourselves up. Um, understanding that in the majority of disasters, the beginning, um, it's it's a true wilderness search perspective where you know our our wilderness teams deploy for three days in austere environments. In a disaster, it's the same thing for the first few days before the logistics can catch up. So making sure that your team can uh, manage its own um, care and feeding until until the logistics uh, tail can catch up is important. So we we already do this, but this is more for other teams <coughs> that we we send up food, water, and stuff to manage um, for a long period of time on top of the normal stuff they carry in their packs. Uh, making sure that your team leaders understand the leader's intent and are all on the same page is important. And this is this is basic stuff, but it's it when you get into a large scale disaster, what was happening was, and I can only speak for our team, we were getting a lot of our team leaders pulled from our teams to go be leaders for other teams. Um, and so making sure that they not only, I mean, they're good operators, but they also then have to be good ambassadors and working with other teams that have different levels of skills and understand and, and not be frustrated with that is important. So we're, we do a little bit of discussion in our leadership classes about um, leading other teams. Um, and this was a good, this event showed why that's important. Um, we required for this specific event, for this fire, we required that all of our team members going had to go in county vehicles and not in personal vehicles. And that caused a little bit of angst with some of our team members because they wanted to control it. But in the end, it ended up working out well because these, you know, I, my work car was up there and to this day, six months later, when I walk, get in it, it still smells like a barbecue because of the smoke that's in there. And so I hate for people to take their personal vehicles up there and have them, you know, permanently smoked out because of this event. So we won't send people up in their own cars into these disaster zones. <clears throat> And the last lead from a local perspective is the critical incident stress debriefing. We did that. We have a very strong group within our county. But one of the things we missed was, uh, and I shouldn't say missed, what we could do better at was it wasn't so much our team affected by the, the numbers of humans that they had to deal with because it was hit or miss. We probably, my team was probably involved in five fines over the whole course. But there were so many dead animals there, and a lot of our volunteers were really affected by the number of dead and burned, and some still alive but in pain up there. <clears throat> and we really missed that opportunity to, to work through that until a little bit later. Um, we're at the state level. We're we're going to really be developing this uh, incident management team program, and really around how to develop and be really strong at developing a, uh, the incident action plan, publishing and process. Um, I want to just skip through here so we can get to questions. I apologize for going a little bit long. Um, developing um, SAR depth so we have enough people um, from team to team to be able to fill a lot of these, these management positions, specifically technology specialists, um, volunteers who can actually be section chiefs and branch directors in these mutual aid operations enough equipment to be able to deploy. Um, we only have a few search and rescue teams that can go up and, and set up a command post anywhere. Um, and we wanna make sure that we can, or we're gonna try and build that out so there's more local teams that have that ability. Um, we're locally, our team, we have a USAR program, an urban search and rescue program, and we're really changing that to an all hazard disaster response uh, program. So not really um, always focus on earthquakes, but. Uh, now we're focusing on deployments to floods, fires, and earthquakes. So it's a little bit of evolution on our disaster. Um, and lastly, well, the thing I really want to, to point out is some of the things that Search and Rescue did. The team performance of all of those 50 plus teams that went up there was amazing and incredible. And uh, there, I didn't hear too many, too, I didn't hear any personnel problems or any you know really issues where people weren't getting along. Um, that was great. We had a lot of good people step up into leadership roles. You know, this is a very this was a very stressful environment, and you know, 
looking for for people that have died is really tough. We had really good leadership out there uh, working with each of the teams and making sure that they stayed on point and on task and, and were able to process. Incident management, you know, again, we brought in program um, managers from lots of different teams that step in and help and work together. That worked out really well. And the, just the, the Semper Gumby attitude, the ability to come into an environment no one's ever worked in and be flexible and, and, and mission driven was amazing. Um, as I just mentioned, mission focused is, was huge. Everyone was there for the right reasons. <clears throat> and one of the last things I want to point out was the fact that we had, you know, hundreds and hundreds of SAR volunteers and, and not to mention law enforcement, fire and the National Guard. But our number of injuries with this event was minimal at best. <clears throat> We had a couple of heat related issues, a twisted knee. I think the worst we had were two cat bites where some SAR volunteers tried to rescue some some cats and got bit and ended up having to go to the hospital. But overall, um, the injuries, it's just a testament to the training and, and experience of our, our uh, responders that they didn't, they were in an area where it was very easy to get hurt and they didn't. And so that was, that's again, a testament to, to California training and expectations of their SAR team. So I, I don't I want to end on that that point that there was some really good um, professional response from from the SAR volunteers throughout the state. Uh, most destructive fire uh, again 14,000 homes. I just can't equate that to anything. That's just crazy. Largest SAR response. Um, extremely challenging, stressful conditions at all levels, but. Overall, we were able to, within 17 days, we were able to clear all of those 19,000 structures um, to, a, to a level that the sheriff was comfortable to repopulate into those areas. Um, it was a challenge integrating fire law and search and rescue, um, but again, we failed forward and it, and it worked out really, as frustrating as some points got, um, everyone was there for the right reasons and worked well. Very unique environment for SAR, but they, they hit it out of the park. Um, some of the questions we're talking about now is, you know, what are the long-term health issues of, you know, annually sending SAR members into these really destructive, smoky environments? And, and so there's more to come on that. I don't want to spend too much time there. <clears throat> um, and then we have locally, internally, we just have post-event. Uh, we're just continuing to follow up with the, the critical incident stress with our uh, local members. Um, but again, great commitment by all. So with that, uh, I know I, I talked fast and I apologize for that. There was a lot of information I just threw at you. I'll head up, give it back to the moderator, the next steps. Thank you, Rick, for sharing the details and lessons learned from that devastating fire. It's such a huge operation to manage. Um, so thank you. Um, we will now answer the questions that I gathered during the presentation. and. If anyone has any additional questions, please submit them now using the questions function on the dashboard. Uh, Rick, you may have answered some of the questions during the presentation, but it will be important to highlight some of these uh, to restate the takeaways. Um, so with that, we'll begin. And uh, this is a big one uh, starting out. So, uh, so when the next big fire comes, what would you do differently? What resources do you wish you had more of? Um, yeah, it's really hard for me to, because that's sort of answering a question for a lot of different um, first responder agencies that might be out there. So I'll answer it sort of locally from my experience. Um, for sure, the PPE and having to ensure that, you know, all of the operators have PPE. And as I mentioned, that was identified really quickly early on. But there were there were two days, or at least the first 24 hours, that um, teams didn't have that PPE. So if we could have a cache or caches throughout the state where we could just grab them and go, that's something I know we're working on uh, for sure. Uh, so the the California mutual aid system is amazingly strong. So the resources we had the resources. It was just a matter of um, so that's not a struggle. But I think PPE would be number one. Um, expectation management locally. Uh, we we um, specifically uh, shortened our deployment times for our team members. Uh, the state was asking for four days deployment, and we specifically only allowed for each deployment uh, our teams to be out in the field sifting through um, 
the debris for two days. And then if they wanted to stay two more days, we put them in the command post. Uh, so one of the things I would, we need to look at, again, it's really hard to assess, but what is four days straight digging through um, this debris going to have long-term effect on um, individuals? So that's why I keep going back to PPE. Uh, but locally, our resource request capability is so strong, and I can't speak for the rest of the country, but the fact that within a week we're having 400 people a day deploy is a huge testament to our, our local systems. Okay. All right, next question. Uh, did you use any dogs to help sniff out uh, for bodies or missing persons? Yes. So we um, we had a lot of dogs up there. I, I apologize. I don't have the exact number, but we had uh, canines from a couple of state programs. California Rescue Dog Association is, is our state office emergency services canine program that they brought in C1 and C2 dogs. We also had a couple other um, pro state programs that were there. And then each individual county, if they had um, self had self certified canines, they were able to bring their dogs as well. So on any given day, I think we had between ten and twenty canines. We ended up um, doing an EMAC request, which is a, a federal, a, a nationwide mutual aid request, and we were starting to um, uh, line up canines from other states to come in to, to augment our local canines. <laughs> There's still I think a lot of assessment that needs to be done on the efficacy um, of how well they worked. And this is just me speaking as Rick, not as a SAR coordinator or as a search and rescue person. If I put that much time and training into my canine um, to make them a certified search dog, I don't think I would personally deploy them into this. Um, there is no PPE for those dogs. There is You could put booties on, the, on their feet, but they were down there breathing the stuff in and, you know, I don't know. This is again, this is Rick talking. I'm not speaking for canine programs. So if you're a canine handler, please don't beat me up. Um, I don't know if the return on investment is worth the risk that they're putting their canines to. Um, in a debrief we went to last week or last month with the anthropologist, they had some statistics where a canine would make a, a an alert and they'd call in. And this is only over two days. I'll give you this number. Um, they had 19 alerts by canines that they went and searched for remains, and they only found remains of one person on those alerts. So I think um, there's a lot more training that needs to be done on um, searching for human remains in an area where you know bodies have been burned, burned down to you know small little pieces of bone. Um, so it's again me anecdotally talking, but I. I think there's a lot more work and research that needs to be put in to see if that's an effective use of that type of resource. Wow, yeah, I can see how that would be an issue just from the magnitude of the fire and how badly everything was burned. Um, on that note too, the, for the next question, how many persons remain unlocated? <laughs> um, anecdotally, there's one to two that are out there that may or may not um, be in the burn area. Um, they think that they found all of the, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of the right term, um, 85, um, but there are, there's, I believe one or two that they're not totally sure if they were there or not, but they haven't been able to close the case. Okay, next question. Could you touch on safety procedures and major safety concerns? Uh, for instance, did each team go through a SAR GAR check? So yeah, um, SAR GAR, I can't speak that every of those 54 counties, if all of them understand SAR GAR, if they're a, if they're a MRA team, they do. Um, so we did a, um, we had a safety briefing in the morning um, and as part of the IEP, there was briefings, written material, but the, the safety briefing was rather copious during the operations brief in the morning and we actually had a safety officer assigned um, who would would um, touch on all the safety issues and then the expectation is as the uh, when they get the assignment that the team leader goes through the safety briefing in the IAP. With that being said, some of our big areas of concern that we had were uh, this being somewhat of a rural community, there were a lot of um, a lot of wells, there were a lot of um, septic tanks, 
and we found a couple of places where it burned out where people could step in and fall into a septic tank um, and multiple locations where that could happen and so we briefed very heavily on be careful when you're working around these residences and luckily we didn't have anyone fall in um, to that but I think there was a there was a fire pickup truck that actually dropped a wheel into one um, no one got dirty or, or wet or anything but yeah that, that was a huge one um, we also needed to make sure that everything was de-energized in the area and because this was such a large burned out area that was um, we felt a lot safer with the de-energization of the lines um, the year before in Sonoma because of the fire being um, bouncing all over a community. Um, we weren't always 100% certain, had to wait for PG&E to come and tell us that this area was, was de-energized. So that, was, that wasn't as big a concern. Um, but again, uh, the, and the last thing was one of the things post-fire that happens is I think fire has, has, there's some statistical analysis about tree burns in that I think within 72 hours, they don't fall down right away, but they do start falling within 48 to 72 hours. And just warning our teams as they're searching around these burned areas to to not have a widow maker come fall down on them um, so we require requested and brief them on the fire side of the lces and having lookouts and, and doing safety each time they, each residence they went to that they did a 360 perimeter um, but going back to the gar um, we didn't brief <laughs> overall to gar um, but i know our team the team i've managed does man use that on each each assignment they go out on Okay, and, and this is kind of along the same lines, if there's anything you want to add, and, and there's a question that says, do you have a process for documenting uh, SAR volunteer incidents and injuries? Yeah, well, in, in California, we have a very strong system. Um, the state has what's called a disaster service worker program, um, and it's basically our, our insurance for volunteers that the state manages. So each volunteer has to sign this form and then if there's an injury, uh, at least I can speak locally. So if there's an injury, we have our own reporting procedures within the county where it has to go to risk management as well as my chain and documented. And then the DSW side, I have to report to the state SAR coordinator that we had an injury and start that process. So if the injury happened at the event or within you know, a week of the event, we have a really good process for that. In addition, what I've done locally here is I've taken the sign-in sheets for each day for, for Contra Costa's response, and I put a copy in each person's folder that said on this date they responded to this event. And that's, um, as, as bad as it sounds, that's for long-term planning. You know, post 9-11, these firefighters and police officers are coming down with cancers and things. Um, this is kind of our, um, our preparation for that potential. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I certainly want to have a record somewhere in someone's file. If, you know, someday they come down with mesotheliomia, or and it's linked to to disaster response that we can show in their file that yep, they were there. Okay. Um, one more uh, question, and then there's a couple of questions that I'll, I'll cover at the end. But um, did you have any? issues using or challenges using drones where, with regulations and, and so forth? So yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of coordination that has to happen. So if it's an active fire, um, most likely you're gonna have uh, CAL FIRE uh, air resources either dropping or, or mapping. So our drones can't go into any of those areas, but they absolutely have to coordinate with the air ops person. So where, where our drones were working were in areas that were completely burned out and there was no more firefighting, um, but they had to get permissions and they had to file their plans. And they, I think I wasn't with them, but I believe they had a CAL FIRE person with them as their liaison while they were doing that. So just in case there was gonna be a shift and all of a sudden there were these firefighter planes and helicopters coming through. One of the interesting asides that we had from an air ops perspective was the president came for a visit and when the president comes for a visit, all air ops have to stop, even firefighting air ops. Um, so again, that didn't affect our part of the management, but it was very interesting to hear that um, all air ops were ceasing for the couple hours that he was touring. Um, and so that is, that's a bigger picture a logistics issue. Okay, and uh, I, I just got one more question in here that uh, I think is important. It says, what programs were used for the online survey and could we get a copy of the questions asked? 
Um, I certainly can get you a copy of questions asked. We, uh, my team used SurveyMonkey. Uh, Marin County put together the survey for the state, and I can't speak offhand what that is, but I'm, I know we can follow up and, and, and create that, but I can, I can provide you with a copy of the, our survey monkey, and then you can put that out if you want. Okay. Um, and then there's a couple of questions regarding the, uh, the, the, about the presentation being recorded and, uh, you will be able to access this, the recording at uh, www.pmirope.com. And um, there was another question about will this presentation be available? And, and so if you have anything else to say about that, please add that now and you know, add any fin final words. Um, otherwise, yeah, they can, they can see this in its entirety at uh, pmirope.com. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a problem sharing this. There's nothing secret squirrel or, or, or shedding negative light on there. So that's, that's fine. One thing I didn't do is I didn't put my contact information on there. And I don't know if you have a way, if, if people have individual questions, they can contact me offline as well. Um, yeah. If you want to go ahead and state it now, if you want. And uh, I, I think we can also, you know, provide something to the MRA members. Mm -hmm. uh, we can send an email out if they have any questions there too. Do you want me to give the email out or you want to wait till that? That's up to you, go. Okay, go. so it's uh, R K O V as in Victor, A at S O, that's Sam Ocean dot C C County dot U S. So three C's dot U S. So R K O V A at S O dot C C County dot U S. Okay, great. Do you have any final closing comments to make? No, I, I appreciate the, the time to present this. I think the, the big thing, I'm a big proponent of after action and improvement plans and our individual program is, is doing a lot of things that, are, that we've learned from this event. So I'm, I'm more than happy to share those and as well as what the state is doing. <clears throat> I don't wanna speak for them, but I can high level talk about, you know, again, we're really gonna focus on um, incident support slash incident management team development of our individual SAR teams to be able to really backfill some of these uh, incident or section specific positions on this type of event. You know, it's, I hate to be trite, but these type of events seem to be the new normal. Uh, you know, two years ago, we thought that that fire was crazy in the North Bay. And then this last year, we had several in California that were huge. Um, and this one in particular was a, uh, was beyond huge. And so we just need to be prepared for this type of event going forward and, and treat it almost like business as usual. Agreed. And uh, this is one way to get prepared for those uh future events. So uh, I want to say thank you to Rick Kovar for sharing this important information with the search and rescue community. Uh, I would like to say thank you to everyone for attending today's uh, Pigeon Mountain Industries and Mountain Rescue Association technical webinar series. Uh, again, this, this webinar has been recorded and will be available soon at uh, www.pmirope.com. And we will have more webinars coming up soon. And they are always held on the first Tuesday of the month at 12 o'clock p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. And we will be sending out notifications via email and so, social media. So watch for future important topics in technical rescue. This is the end of the webinar. Thanks again and have a great day.